and distribution of North American Parthenocissus. And I work with Dr. Elizabeth Zimmer um, at the Smithsonian. So this is my lab. Um, it's the Smithsonian Museum Support Center in Suitland, Maryland. Um, if any of you guys are planning or thinking about working here, it's kind of, you have to go through a lot of security measures, so I suggest you know, starting early in the summer before you actually come here during the school year so that you can just you know clear away um, all the procedures and complicated issues so you don't have any troubles here. But yeah, it was, um, it was a good experience. So yeah, that's um, my mentor, Dr. Elizabeth Zimmer. She's the Smithsonian National Museum of Natural History um, Department of Botany Curator, and she's also a research leader. And some of her past um, work has involved developing nuclear ribosomal gene models for phylogenetic evolutionary and evolutionary processing. So, um, yeah, she really works with So, some goals of the Smithsonian lab um, we would like to study the pattern and processes of molecular evolution in green plants, and we would also uh, like to use ribosomal and chloroplast gene markers for molecular systematic studies of the plants. So, um, you know, important plant species that can help us determine how the evolution of certain types of plants. So, my uh, project goals were to compare the ITS region um, to chloroplast results from each parthenosis is clay, and I'll talk about that um, a little more. And then I'll, I also wanted to create a consensus tree and then deter determine if uh, vicariance occurred. And I'll discuss all of these terms later on. So the plant I worked with is called Parthenocissus. Um, it's commonly known as the Virginia creeper. Um, I worked with three species, and there are three species uh, commonly found in North America. The top is uh, Quinquefolia, Peptophila, and then Vitaceae. Um, and they are in the grape family. And they do look um, pretty similar, but there are slight morphological differences. Um, Heptophila has seven leaves, for example, and Phytaceae has tendrils that have pads on them, but it's hard to see here. Um, <clears throat> so a little overview of chloroplast DNA. Chloroplast DNA uh, includes spacer regions that don't code for proteins, and these spacer regions are what makes chloroplast DNA so highly uh, mutable. So they mutate rapidly, and uh, thus they are useful for population level analyses. Um, turn C pet N is one such spacer region, um, and this is one of the spacer regions that I examined in my project, and it's easily sequenced, um, it's considered a barcoding marker, and it's been used to classify a lot of other different things besides preferences. Um, so another spacer region I looked at is called the ITS region. It stands for internal transcribed spacer. Um, the ITS region, which was kind of bad because then I couldn't really draw any conclusions based on the samples. Um, yeah, my mentor kind of didn't tell me that they could be contaminated by fungi. I don't know why. Maybe she forgot or maybe she wanted to surprise me. <laughs> yeah. So, um, what happened was the primers that I added attached to the fungal DNA instead of the plant DNA like it was supposed to. So the ITS regions did not have primers while the fungal DNA did, and then when I ran the gels, nothing happened. So yeah, it's kind of sad. Um, so yeah, normally there is enough DNA, um, plant DNA, for the primers to attach to, but um, the one species that I worked with by Casey is actually pretty, you know, um, hard to work with and it's really variable. So um, yeah, apparently ITS sequencing is actually really attempted with take seed, which is what I tried to do. So she I guess she believed that you were smart yeah. and capable. She knew you were. <laughs> yeah, so um, it didn't work out, but it was a good experience concerning the ITS region. Um, but for my turn C regions, um, two of them actually worked. So uh, I successfully amplified um, a decent amount, and then I was able to sequence that amount. And then um, I took those two samples and I aligned them with the samples that um, the other scientists sequenced before. And my two samples matched with um, 12 of his samples, so like the sequences matched up. And then there were actually, it was interesting to see two nucleotides um, in my samples and some of his samples, 
they actually all differed in like the same the same spot. So um, you could see that there was some sort of uh, differentiation from the ancestral uh, sequences. And this is what that looks like. So here at the top, these are my two sequences, and you can see that um, at this spot right here, there's a G instead of an A, and then at here there's um, a T instead of a G, and that matches with some of his samples, like down here and up here, while these are the ancestral um, DNA sequences. Uh, find primers and use them to attach to any fungal DNA that may um, be present in future samples because you never know it might happen again. Um, and then after that, I would probably try to get other forward and reverse primers to work because I actually worked with a couple others, but they didn't work um, as well as Turn C did. So maybe we can, you know, revise protocol for those primers and then maybe we'll see something new. And also improve um, PCR protocol because sometimes when I would PCR in my samples, they wouldn't turn out, you know, like, as they should. They weren't amplified. So. Um, so I would uh, like to acknowledge my mentor, Dr. Liz Zimmer, and also um, Gabe Johnson. He worked a lot with me. He's a lab tech, and he helped me a lot with the um, procedures and stuff. And then, of course, Dr. Cobb and Mr. Pierce and um, the Smithsonian for you know, letting me work with them and uh, the teacher's mentorship program.